Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you guys. Right. How you doing? Good. Good. I know how to throw away question that is when there's lots of you. For me, it's just a way of acknowledging that I see you. Can't actually answer how you're doing. Um, it, it is good to see you guys. It's good to have another Sunday. Uh, today's a special Sunday. Did you did you know that? Mm-hmm. The beginning of Advent. You all woke up this morning excited about that fact. I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, you notice the blue behind me here from our uh, brothers and sisters in the Lutheran Church. Um, but yeah, this is, for me, this is my favorite time of year. Um, a few years back, uh, my family started to bring back something that was a part of uh, my childhood, which is the Advent wreath. Do you remember the Advent wreath? Do you know what this is? Or the Advent calendar? That comes a little later, but the Advent wreath actually comes a little later, too, in the history of Advent. But, um, yeah, f- uh, four candles, you light one on each Sunday. Each one is connected to a different theme uh, in, in that interpretation of the season, like hope, peace, joy, and love. There's a pink candle on the third week for joy, a uh, little lighter. But Advent, Advent has been special for me, not because it's like a prep for Christmas. And unfortunately, I think Advent gets that reputation that it's just prep for Christmas. It's just a way of getting us ready for Christmas. And uh, we need that help too, I think, to have a, a good, good help uh, in thinking uh, biblically, I think, about Christmas. But this isn't just that. Um, now, you've heard me say the word Advent a few times. And if you're paying attention, uh, you should be asking, what does that word actually mean? (laughs) Um, And so you think of it uh, like uh, arrival or coming. Uh, And it's a word that's been a part of the church's life for a long time. We are a part of a a tradition of of churches where we we don't use language like Advent and liturgy and Lent and Epiphany. We don't celebrate the 12 days of Christmas. Did you know Christmas is actually a whole season? You remember the song, right? On the first day of Christmas, right? It, it's, it harkens back to a season. Christmas has always been a season within the life of the church. Some of you are tuning out as soon as I use language like that, so I'll be careful <laughs> because it's bringing you back to a place you, you might not want to go. But I've found this uh, to be helpful for for just number one for organizing my thinking about where I am within the the unfolding drama of God's reign. It's helped me uh, tremendously. So I think today what I'd like to do is a longer introduction into what the season of Advent might mean. And then I want to, I want to, Describe some more of that by looking at the prophet Isaiah, which is where where we'll land. Uh, But this is an opportunity, I think, for us to learn from some of uh, our brothers and sisters from from other traditions. Uh, But Advent, its its basic meaning is arrival. And I said it doesn't have a lot to do with Christmas. Maybe Advent poses a question to which Christmas gives a response. But Advent is its own season, and it's actually the beginning throughout the history of uh, liturgy in the church. I'll describe that more in a moment, too. Uh, But it's the beginning of the church year. So the church year starts with Advent. It starts with the arrival. Now, immediately, arrival, of course, the arrival of God incarnate in human form. Right? In the, in the Middle East, a child was born. We hail him as God. We worship him. So that is definitely a part of Advent, thinking about the coming of God in human form in the birth of Christ. But it's not about somehow tricking ourselves into imagining that that never happened. So, no, so now let's pretend like it didn't happen and wait for it to happen on Christmas. That doesn't make a ton of sense. Advent actually is about the once coming of God in the birth of Christ and the future coming of God 
Did you know that we're waiting for something as Christians? We're not just here to, to bide our time and build a, build a nice, pleasant church and then die. We're actually, our imaginations should be soaked with the biblical story, which tells us that God actually will return and appear. And what we are longing for, only he can do. And we live lives of waiting. It's a great way to begin the year. It's, it's, a, it's a time of reflection and repentance. It's a time of evaluating where we are personally, where we are communally, and repenting. And that is good news that we might. But it's about living in anticipation of an arrival. Now, uh, as I said, it's not about turning back the clock, but it does help us think better about time. It does help us to inhabit time a little better. How, are you still with me? You guys doing okay? It's like philosophy class for a few minutes and then we'll look at scripture. But see, time is organized for us by the calendar, right? Which is not the only calendar in existence, the one we follow. The moments throughout the year that help us think clearly about the direction of time and tell us who we are. Think of our holidays. Think of the, the, the rhythms in the church, like we know when the marriage retreat typically comes, when our conferences typically come, when our retreats typically come. They all organize our lives for us, these moments. Think of as an American, holidays like the 4th of July, which tell us who we are every year. We come back to this moment, and it's not like 4th of July is happening again, but somehow it's like time overlaps and we re-inhabit something that happened and tells us about the present and actually about the future. So time helps us. Uh, this, our, I'm sorry, calendars help us think about time. But the sentiment of the liturgical year, last time I'll use that phrase, I promise, the church year is to help us think about time and organize time according to God's works in history, which in fact, as it turns out, we don't believe are just located somewhere in the past, but we believe that history, so to speak, rhymes, and it shall happen again. It's really amazing. Did you know when Moses brought the Israelites to the shore of the Jordan River before, well, according to the narrative, it's as if they're standing at the shore of the Jordan River, before they're about to go in and take uh, hold of this promised land, Moses said, you remember how God appeared to us. But see, the people he was talking to weren't there when God appeared. That was their parents who had long died. But he could say to us, but we weren't there, but it's us. What happened was to us, even though we weren't there. It tells us who we are. It's, you stumped yet? It's, it's, it's a brain buster. But this is what it means, I think, to enter into moments like Christmas or Easter or the significant moments within our year that still, and I would say are more important than any other calendar we follow. The birth, the death, the resurrection of Christ, Pentecost, the ascension, these moments within the biblical story should tell us much more about who we are and where time is headed than, say, Valentine's Day or the American way of construing time. See, the Bible has its own way of ordering time so that we can understand who we are, but when we are within the unfolding drama. How you doing? Good. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Now, uh, this might help you. Here's what I've been saying. Okay. You, you have... The reign of God or the age to come. One whole reality. One that we are probably like, yeah, where is that? I want that. But we also have our present situation. Paul calls it in Galatians and in Ephesians, this 
evil age or the present, the age which is governed somehow by sin and death. But the point of Scripture, of the New Testament, is to say the age to come and this present evil age we inhabit has already started to overlap in Jesus Christ. And the people of God live between times. We live between moments. The resurrection of our Lord, the ascension of our Lord, the birth of our Lord, and the coming of our Lord, which we anticipate. And if you think that won't happen, you're in the wrong building. Because that's what we're here longing for, praying for, searching after, trying to participate in the age to come, which has already started, because we know it will be brought to fulfillment one day. Still with me? Yeah, we're good. It's two ages overlapping with one another. But now, this, this means then that if this is a season of anticipating God's arrival, hopefully that's what we learn to long for. Hopefully we learn to see ourselves as in between moments within God's history. Now, we don't talk about God coming back much in church. That's because we got rid of Advent. There's no real time for it. We don't talk much about God coming back. Self included. I'm speaking in front of churches. I rarely get up and say, let's talk about the, the coming, the arrival of God in the future. Now, there are a number of reasons why we don't talk about that. It's unfortunate. And I think it deforms us as God's people to imagine that what we really need to do is just focus on the now. And I get the, the, it can go turn south on you if you focus too much on the future. We know what left behind and Tim LaHaye and all of that looks like. And it is to be criticized and thrown down and it doesn't help us. It's destructive. But to lop off the future, to lop off our hope from who we are now is to do damage to the church. Because we begin to believe then, I remember, uh, this might surprise some of you because I, it surprises me, but there was a time where I was a college minister, um, which I never saw myself doing. And even as I was doing it, I was like, what am I doing? I'm a college minister. Like, I barely made it through college. Um, and I don't really know how to have fun. My idea of fun is studying Torah and, like, <laughs> listening to, you know, beats. Like, <laughs> um, but... But I remember going to a college ministry conference in Manhattan. And the theme of the conference was change the world. It's exciting. I remember thinking, like, you know, this is, this is what we need for the younger generation, a vision of changing the situation we live in. I think that's, that's what's missing. And then I had another thought that might be idolatrous. That might turn on us if we're not careful. Because see, the church, we don't believe that the change agent, the central figure who does the changing of the world is us. I hope you don't think that you're going to change things. I hope you don't think that if we get the right plan and the right conviction and the right minister and the right whatever else that we're just going to somehow swing creation into the age to come by our power. Of course we don't think that, but in practice we can begin to live like that, like it's on us, because we've, we've forgotten to long. We've forgotten to pray for God's coming, and to, as we're going to see today, walk in the light of the Lord, participate we cannot create utopia on our own. That's the myth in secular society, by the way. If we get the right policies, the right person in charge, we will march up to where the garden was, overthrow the cherubs that God placed there to keep us out, and storm right through the garden gate back into Eden if we just get enough power, courage, and faith. 
We don't believe that. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We believe that only God can do what only God can do. And it shall only happen when he arrives to renew all things. As it says at the end of the New Testament, see, look, behold, I make all things new. Not I make all new things, by the way. But see, I restore all things. Advent gives us a moment, an opportunity to acknowledge the time between. How are you doing? Two more points on Advent and we'll look at Isaiah and how this comes together. Advent then is a moment for facing the darkness. Acknowledging it. That's another thing we hate. This might actually explain why we don't uh, talk much about (laughs) God's return. Because it would mean that we'd have to learn to grieve the situation we live in. It means that we'd have to turn down the TV long enough to hear the cries of the oppressed. It would mean that we'd have to pay attention to the lies which control most folks. Acknowledge the violence, the racism, the deception, which is thick. It's even in my own life. But I'd have to face that, identify it, acknowledge it, pray about it, repent of it as much as I'm able, and lament it. I don't want to do any of that. I want to have a crank in church. I want to have a church that's full of visitors and and neighbors. And I want to focus on how we can get past the hard times and get to, to being the people of God, which is to say, doing what only we can do. But I think Advent is a check to our egos. Say, stop. And remember who the major change agent is in the world. Turn to him. Fix your hearts. Seek him. And participate in what he's already done. That's a different mind. But it requires of the church something we're not very excited about. Let me rephrase. I can't speak for you. I'm not excited about that. But but once we do that, once we see God and the witness of Scripture of God's return, I think we start to find what we call hope. Now, hope, the English word, how useful is that word for us? Not very. Because hope, the English word hope in our society, is rooted in doubt. (laughs) Watch what I mean. I hope he comes back. Which is to say, he might not. (laughs) I I hope it happens, which is to say... It might not. I hope it does. See, for us, I think, hope and wish are kind of the same thing. We hope it happens. I'm optimistic about it. Biblical hope will have none of that garbage. None of this, like, optimistic thinking, perhaps it might happen. Biblical hope is rooted in the concrete realities of Jesus' resurrection and the witness of Scripture that He shall come again. Biblical hope does not have anything really to do with doubt. And I wonder if. It's such a firm foundation that almost assurance is a better word than hope. Because hope just doesn't do the trick in our minds. We have assurance. We have a rock upon which to build and build and build. Because we know that God will return. As Paul says, none of your labor shall be in vain. Because he shall return and all shall be changed. In the twinkling of an eye, the dead will be raised immortal. Do we, do we imagine any of that? If not, what are we hoping happens here? <laughs> what, what are we hoping occurs? It's not therapy. I mean, it helps us. But we believe that we have been caught up in the drama of the whole world being transformed by the power and love and mercy of God. But I think there is... A danger of not hoping. I know in in my life, this has been a challenge. And this is maybe why I've gravitated toward this idea. Because I've been through seasons of despair. Have you ever experienced despair? Despair is like the opposite of biblical hope or assurance. 
I think some of us are there, or at least flirting with it. Despair is, it's all going to be the same. Nothing's going to change. Nothing, I look at the situation and it's not, nothing can happen. How it is, is how it shall always be. What it is in the moment dictates what it shall be in the future. Another word for that is despair. We don't imagine that God will do much. We live with a kind of shrunken, unimpressive God we can fit in our pocket. <laughs> but this, this season is an opportunity, I think, a tool maybe, I hate to use that language, that could really help us to begin to live again in between times. Okay, look at Isaiah. Well, do you need to look at it? No, you don't have to. Here. We'll still look at it, but... Uh, the word of Isaiah, son of Amotz. The word Isaiah, son of Amotz, saw uh, in a vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall happen in future days that the mount of the Lord's house shall be firm founded at the top of the mountains and lifted over the hills. All the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion shall teaching come forth, and the Lord's word from Jerusalem and he shall judge among the nations and be arbiter for many peoples. And they shall grind their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not raise against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the Lord's light." Who could imagine more encouraging and more deeply challenging words than this? this? Parts of this are actually written on the wall in the park just around the corner from the United Nations building. Our society even acknowledges what Isaiah is talking about here is exactly what the world is longing for. He's, he says in a future time, uh, in, a, in a time yet to be disclosed, at a time where you are not now, <laughs> Jerusalem shall be exalted. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem, hopefully some of you will. We're doing a tour to Jerusalem in June. Please come. Uh, see me if you want to go to Israel. But you'll notice when you get there, Jerusalem isn't even the highest hill around it. But here's a vision that the prophet sees of Jerusalem being exalted above the mountains around her. And that is impressive because if we were to go back and read chapter 1, a scathing rebuke to God's people. Isaiah 1 might be one of the hardest <laughs> bits of scripture to read. He effectively says to the people of God in Jerusalem, I'm not listening to your singing anymore. Enough with your songs and your hymnals and your Stratocasters and your Ludwigs and your Roland keyboards and your tambourines. Enough with your PowerPoints and your singing. I'm not listening. I don't care about your worship. Learn to do good. Take care of the needy. I'd rather have that in addition to the singing than just singing. Put it away. I'm sick of it. Amos says something like this too in Amos chapter 5. He says of Jerusalem, the faithful city has become a whore, a prostitute filled with violence. One few verses later, Isaiah is saying, I see Jerusalem exalted above the hills. What in the world? And the nations are, and it uses the word, nahar, it's streaming. It's a word used for rivers. 
Nations usually stream to Jerusalem, but it's usually to attack it. But here, the nations are streaming into this city that a chapter later was called a prostitute. Is it because Israel got their act together? No. No, no, no. That wouldn't be good enough. Isaiah sees a future that is startling given the present. Imagine the end of the military. Well, some of us, oh my God. Imagine all wars taking a permanent sabbatical. No more basic training. Every machine gun we have, we turn into an agricultural implement to make and grow. That's what Isaiah sees. Isaiah sees the end. Wars, militaries, defenses become redundant because in the future, the nations will deal with their problems by gathering before the Lord and he shall help them work it out. They won't need to kill each other. That's the future. I sound like a liberal, don't I? But here's, here's the vision for the church. This has nothing to do with our politics. The prophet sees an age which is coming. And the nations will notice how gentle and loving God has been with his people. They'll see how he forgives them. And they'll stream up to this little hill. Let's learn his ways. Because ours are ruining us. Let's learn his ways. Come with me. What are you talking about? Jerusalem. You ever heard of it? That little, little town? 20 miles east of the Jordan River? Like, what are we going to learn there? Jacob's God? Are you kidding me? There's nothing left there. Yeah, let's go there. Because their God is all-powerful. You see, this is a universal picture. He's not a small local national deity. He is the God of all creation. All nations belong to Him. All nations shall stream to Him. Like it or not, you'll have to deal with different others in God's kingdom. People that don't look or think or smell like you. Or me, or us. They don't even think about the Bible maybe the same way we do. Yet, they shall inhabit this future, which is so quantum beyond our piddly attempts to change the world. I don't want to offend anyone here, but I think Isaiah has offended us. He said, it's not about y'all. Learn to wait. Now, waiting doesn't mean, of course... Let's go grab a beer. Let's, let's kick it. Let's go watch what do you, what's on Netflix. Waiting doesn't mean kick your feet up and relax. God will take care of it in the end. It couldn't mean that. That would make no sense. That would be a limp, flimsy kind of hope. But he says, come, let us walk in the Lord's light. What would it look like for the people of God, as broken as you are, you may have had an awful week because of the holidays. Uh, do the holidays ever trigger you? They do for me. Holy cats. You may have had a week where you can't imagine anything good shall come from you. That's okay. That's okay. We could even imagine as a community, all of us together, we're still really weak. That's okay. Because we are summoned to participate in the work of God. What God shall do. Look what God's going to do. Are you following me? Look what God's going to do. This isn't point number one. Go, go get your neighbor to church. Point number two. Baptize them. That's all true too. Do that. <laughs> but this is, look at what's going to happen. Do you see it? Can you, can you, can you even imagine what God might do, what he says he'll do, live in light of that. It's like a light in the future that's shining so bright, it's shined across the ages into the present. And here we stand in the light of what God's going to do. If God's going to bring the nations together and end wars, what do you think that means for us? How about your neighborhood? 
Or as you go out, or the person who, uh, I live in the HOA. HOAs are a thing in California. Oh, they're the worst. <laughs> they're the worst. You can't do anything. But I have to love my community. Not just follow the rules. Be neighborly. I imagine a world where God brings all together. It affects how I live now. That is what Advent is all about. That is the central hope of the church. It's so fitting that the beginning of the church year for ages has started with the end. Let's look at what God shall do, what God has already done, looking back at the cross, looking forward to the future, and seeing here we are. We are the people who live between world-changing moments. And it's not lost on us. We don't act like it doesn't matter. We don't act like it's just about us and our own personal growth. We believe we participate in a reality that's even larger than we ever imagined when we, we first came to church and read scripture about us needing to repent. All of a sudden we start to see it's bigger than just my sin and my growth. I'm a part of something bigger than the ICOC than the Anglican Church, than the Presbyterians, than the entire denominational world. I'm a part of a cosmic reality. And that should influence how we live. And if it doesn't, then we have some work to do. Praise God for a season where we can devote time to just thinking through some of that. Let's take the Lord's Supper. Even this meal we take, it's like Every Sunday, I think I've said this before, I've said it a lot, I don't know if I've said it to y'all, but it's like getting in a DeLorean. You remember the DeLorean? Back to the future? Time travel. You get in the DeLorean, and you punch in the, da the, the dashboard, uh, whatever year Jesus was crucified, or that last supper, and we go back in time to that moment, in this bread and this cup. We're all brought back to a moment. We never were there. We don't know what it looks like. We never heard Jesus cry. We never saw a crucifixion. We've never seen any of that. Most of us haven't even been to the Middle East. But somehow, in our thinking, we go back there every Sunday. We go back in the story to that moment. And while we're there in the past, we're also slingshotted forward to the future. It's like we chime travel every single Sunday back to the past as an indication of what the future shall be, back to the present. How shall we live? Look what Paul says. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This meal isn't just, I hope it works out. This meal is, the Lord is coming back. This meal is, we will share this anew with the Lord in his kingdom. We drink now and anticipate what we shall be one day. See, the, the people of God are all about the future. And the future makes them all about the present. It's really cool. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for uh, this great indescribable, stabilizing hope. We thank you, God, that you have given us a picture of the future that is greater than any myth we could be offered, any, uh, anything we could achieve on our own. You've given us a hope to stand on that changes everything for us, God. And we pray to you to take it all on board as much as we are able and to humbly uh, live in response to it. To live in response to what you've done at the cross. The great love you've shown us personally and the whole world. That you've, you've brought us in. You've made us participants in something so wonderful. We never imagined uh, it could be this good. And we thank you, God. 
Help the joy of your kingdom, the joy of living between times to just surprise us and burst upon us. God, help the peace which comes from living between these moments fill our hearts and help the love, God, which attends those things, maybe gathers all them up to flow from us, Lord, because we're not frightened We're not living fearful, fretted lives. We're not living lives which assume it's based on us, but we're living in the light of the Lord. We thank you, God. We pray these things through Christ Jesus. Amen.